recording. Right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Dwarves Coaching Podcast with myself, Tom Nash, and Faye Petcher. We're both uh, Dwarves coaches, as you know, if you've been watching the channel now for a little while. Uh, today, we actually have a very exciting guest. Uh, so we have my lovely friend and family law partner, Poi Euro, from Hunter Euro Solicitors. Um, I've been working with Poi for a little while now, uh, and Poi is very much around focused on the well-being, short-term and long-term of our clients. It's not just legal advice and support, uh, hence why we partner together don't we, Poi, in supporting your clients from an emotional side as well as uh, a legal aspect. Um, today's topic is going to be around uh, new year, new you, and potentially entering into your divorce, uh, new beginnings, should we say. Um, now, Payne and I spoke beforehand, boy. Uh, we've got a whole host of questions, probably too many, um, but we'll get to them in a minute. But if you just want to introduce yourselves and give everybody a bit of an intro, because most people know Faye and I by now. Okay, so uh, I'm Poi. Uh, I am a family law solicitor. I specialise only in family law. I've done it for 12 years, I'd say. Uh, I've worked uh, in London. Um, I originally started off in Nottingham, where I studied. Um, then moved down to Northamptonshire and now have my own firm in Bedfordshire and London. So that's sort of my background. I have a personal experience of going through a divorce, which sometimes I think can help. Um, but, you know, I've done it for many years before I went through a personal experience. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's always interesting to get a personal perspective, but... You know, it's it's something, it's a background that uh, I really enjoy. Uh, family law is something that uh, I think you have to, you have to have um, some sort of personal and people skills to be able to communicate with the client about it. It's not, um, it's not a cold area of law. Mm. I find it's quite a personal area of law. So that's me. I have an instant question that's just popped into my head, which I hadn't thought about before. I know it's only because of what you've just said in your intro. Do you think it made it easier or harder from a personable perspective to go through your own divorce, knowing what you know and doing what you do professionally? Definitely easier, I'd say. Okay. Um, yeah, I, because I know the process. Yeah. So, you know, when someone goes through a divorce and they don't know what to expect. They don't know the legal process. I think it does make it harder. Um, you know, whereas for me, it was more, it was more about managing the emotional side, but actually the legal side and the procedure was, you know, it is what I do. Yeah. So it, it was from that side, it was easier, but yeah, from the emotional side, I'd never gone through it before. So that's something that like all new clients, it's a journey. But I would say being a family solicitor does make it easier. Do you think it maybe made it a bit scarier for your ex? Because obviously you know all the legal aspects, you know the nuts and bolts and the schematics. For me, if, if it was me, I would have been thinking, excuse my French, I would have thought, oh shit, <laughs> I'm, really on the back, I'm really on the back foot here. <laughs> he, he, he may have thought that, um, but I think it makes a really big difference because we, we're really good friends. And so it, it wasn't a case that you, we hated each other and there were pots and pans flying everywhere. It was a case that we sat down and said, right, you know, unfortunately it's not gonna work. What are we gonna do? We, we have a, a child together. So how do we make it work so that it's easiest for, for everyone, you know, and, and most importantly, easiest for our son. Um, I think he found it scary, but he knew me well enough to know that I wasn't going to do anything crazy. And it was just a case of, we both wanted the best for, for our son. Yeah. Okay. It's really good. It's really nice to have you, Poi. And I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but I'm really excited because you are our first guest. I know we've got many more booked in in the new year. Um, so it's really good to have actually someone like yourselves that's going to be able to give our listeners some really practical advice and tips. Because I know when I first instructed solicitor for my first divorce, I didn't have a clue how it worked, what I was going to do. And she was so good at bracketing, so good at saying like, okay, I can see that this is difficult for you, but this is what we're faced with. She gave it to me in such simple and clear steps that it made the process so much easier. And I imagine for you, you have lots of clients that are still struggling with emotions, 
uh, and not knowing what to do, where to turn and the steps there to take. Yeah, I think that is what most clients struggle with. It's not the divorce and finance and, and child arrangements process is it's not a hard one. It's being able to manage the client when they are emotionally all over the place. Um, and they struggle to make, you know, from, from my point of view, really quite simple decisions. But obviously for them, it's, it's not because their mind's not in the right place. They've got to think about all the consequences. Um, whereas I do it with lots of clients going through the same journey. And so I can, I can already foresee what's going to happen. But for them, they, it, it's not that simple. And sometimes you struggle to get quite clear instructions from them, particularly at the beginning, because it's so overwhelming. So where you said, you know, your solicitor explained to you the, to you the process in a step-by-step -step easy way, that is hugely important. The problem that um, we have at the beginning is when a client comes in and they don't know what's going on, they want to have the answers to everything straight away. And so it's hard for, for us to then explain to them, well, you know, when you make a decision like this, there are lots of outcomes that can happen. Um, and it, they become so overwhelmed that it's almost like a rabbit in headlights. And then they don't know what best to do. And that's where we reach out to, you know, divorce coaches, counselors, all these other networks that can help that client just feel their way through and sort of see the wood for the trees a little bit more. It's not just a, it's not just a legal process that is just, you know, in some ways, such a small part of it, yeah. it is the emotional management side of things that that I think clients really struggle with. I know the term rabbit in the headlights is one that resonates a lot with me. I don't know whether that <laughs> does with you, Tom, when you have time to when you think, I haven't got a clue. No, absolutely. I think we've spoken about it before, like the earlier days. I think I remember saying to you in one other where it was... Um, the first night when I'd spoken to my now ex-wife about us separating and obviously she was really upset, really distraught and she wanted her sister to come round. And I remember you and I were talking about this in another video fair. And I said, right, I'll give you a new system space. I'm just going out for a pint of milk. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving the family home. I'm just going out to get paper or whatever. And I think if you remember, I'd said within about half an hour or so, 25 minutes, I'd had messages from a brother saying, you've left the family home. We've spoken to this, blah, blah, blah. That's in the space of like 25 minutes. Um, so that rabbit in the headlights, it really was. Um, and it was really, really scary. Like, what do I do now? What do I do? And this is like 10 o'clock at night. Like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and, and where do I turn now? Um, so yeah, it can be really, really scary um, to not know the processes, but also the overwhelm that comes with it. Well, mm -hmm. if I make that choice and I make that decision now, how does that impact it? What else could happen, etc. So it can be really, really scary. And it's about breaking down that process from a legal perspective but also getting your mindset around an understanding of what you really want and how you want to progress mm. and I and I really enjoyed, actually after my first um initial consultation with the solicitor that i'd chosen i was struggling so hard to keep it all together trying to give her the information that she needed even things like your name and address how old is your daughter which seemed so simple but I really struggled even doing that. And I managed to hold it all together. And I remember walking down the high street where I live in absolute floods of tears because when I walked out the door, I literally fell apart because it was just too much mm. for me to even sit there for that hour and, and do that first, you know, consultation. And I imagine you have, you know, clients that come to you in, in that same position that are really struggling to even give you the basics. It's... um. It's almost like in that moment that the reality of the situation hits them, yeah. you know, to, to take the step to see a solicitor about your marriage coming to an end is, you know, it, it's real, isn't it? It's no longer, you know, talking to friends and family, thinking about should I, shouldn't I end it? If you're sat, you know, in a solicitor's office, it becomes that much more real. Um, and when you're in a meeting with a client, you are trying to get this information, but at the same time, you have to be so careful because they they might be coming in to see you within 24 hours of splitting up with, with their partner. And 
you you're well aware that how they feel will change quite drastically their relationship with their ex might change quite drastically over the course of the next few days weeks or months so we always um say to clients you know don't don't make any decisions now it's a case of having all of the information before you and then maybe taking days weeks months or even you know however long it takes to think about it but it's just it's just information gathering because you can you can see that they are just sort of sitting back being told all of these things and what can and can't happen yeah. Um, and yeah so when you say you walk out of the solicitor's office and it, it's just it all of it's hit you mm. that that's quite a a, a normal reaction so if someone, for some sake, someone's watching this on the 3rd of January um, or at some time after, and they have just had that discussion about separating, divorcing, at what stage should they come and talk to or seek legal advice in particular? So I would always say as soon as possible, because you don't have to do anything other than speak to a solicitor. It's just about getting as much information as you can about your personal situation um, rather than looking online and sort of gathering general information about it. Speak to somebody who can then tailor all the advice that you've seen online to your specific situation because your situation is going to be different to even you know people that you think are in the same situation as you. But there will be those nuances that are different. So speak to a solicitor and from then, hopefully that solicitor will be able to say, you then need to speak to this person, whether that's um, a mortgage advisor, that's normally quite a common one, a counsellor, um, whether that's one-on-one -on -one counselling, whether that's, um, you know, marriage counselling. You know, as family solicitors, we have a responsibility to make sure that you've exhausted all your methods in trying to salvage your marriage. Um, so... It might be a case that you walk away and think, no, I, I don't think I've tried everything. You know, I haven't broached the subject of, of, of um, marriage guidance or whatever with, with my ex, and I want to try that. Um, so in answer to your question, I would say sooner rather than later. Yeah. And it's uh, interesting. One point you said there about... Yeah. Sorry, Tom. You go. Ladies first. <laughs> it's the hardest. I, I know I've got clients now who who don't want to, they're fearful of taking that step to walk into a solicitor's office. Mm. As much as me and Thomas coaches can advise them, if they're not ready, they're not going to do it. And I would say, actually, once, once you've taken that first step and you've got that clarity, you've had those questions answered, you know, that whole weight that you carry around with you of not doing it will, will be lifted. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think, uh, you know, traditionally, it is a big step to walk into a solicitor's office. But now most things are done by telephone or you know virtual meetings and and that sort of uh, pressure is alleviated a little I think it's much easier for people to be able to pick up a phone and speak to a solicitor um, it, it makes it less daunting for them rather than physically walking into a solicitor's office and you know there are so many firms out there that give out um, initial free advice or um, you know a fixed fee consultation those kind of things so it's not going to be a drain on your finances just to find out where you stand yeah yeah I think one of the other important points you raised there about was speaking to people in the early days after maybe you have gone and had a look online but it's also that fine line of looking like when you've got a cough or a cold and doctor google and like you've got a cough and all of a sudden like you've got the world's worst disease it's as much you can go and find all the information it's about actually getting not getting fake news and actually getting real facts from trained professionals that know the system and the processes and what you can and need to do that's right and i think um one one of the issues that uh, typically happens if you just speak to family and friends is you liken your situation to theirs and so we have clients come in and they will say well my friend got 70 percent you know, or, um, you know, husband comes in and says, oh, my wife is going to rinse me and because that's what happened to my friend. And they, they start scaring themselves or give themselves, um, you know, uh, that they're, they're overly optimistic. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I can stay in the house for as long as I like and keep 100 percent of all the assets. And, and the longer you leave it, the harder it is for us as legal advisors to dispel that. Um, 
and sort of to manage their expectations again because all they've done is speak to family and friends who unfortunately you know or fortunately isn't what they do for a living and so they don't see the, the whole spectrum of of cases that we do it's also i suppose quite important where and i say this to people a lot same same as you and i don't know if does as well but it's about getting the right support network around you um the positive support network as well that do that does give you the facts and the information and whilst your nearest and dearest and your loved ones or bob down the pub or whatever and their advice not always necessarily the best input or most positive input and like you said it that's also circumstantial because i've had that with clients that have come to us before and saying and it might be and again, just because I get this quite a lot of doing what I do and being who I am, I get quite a lot of gentlemen that come to me and it's around issues related to their children or, or access to the kids and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, and they still have a myth around, I think a lot of what all three of us do um, and anybody that serves the type of clients that we serve is around dispelling those myths, isn't it? And where they've heard a story from someone that, okay, maybe 25 or 30 years ago, but things have changed. And I think that's one of the other important parts, isn't it? That the perceptions of things that are different um, from somebody's story from 1986 when my parents split up, for example. Um, it's a very, very different process now. Uh, anyway, Faye, I know you've got some questions, so I'll be quiet for a minute. <laughs> That's all right. I was just about to, to agree, really, at the end. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're the same, Tom. You know, our clients will ask us things that we can't answer if, if it's legal. And as much as we have our own experiences, you know, things in the legal world change, I imagine, boy, on a daily and weekly basis. Um, so my fir- my first answer is I can't help you. However, you need to speak to someone who can, because we're not qualified to give out legal advice. We're not qualified to give out financial advice. Mm. Um, I don't know whether you get get the same Tom from your clients. They come wanting to know the answers to those sort of questions that only a, a trained solicitor or lawyer can answer. Yeah. 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 So I mean, boy, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, I think you've covered about what someone should do and taking that first step, which was one of my questions, and it's a big step to take. Mm. Um, one thing that I get asked quite a bit recently is what is the difference between a separation agreement and a divorce, and is a separation agreement needed if you're having a divorce? Okay, so a separation agreement typically deals with things like child arrangements and perhaps... Um, in in more detail, the financial arrangements once parties have separated. The divorce really just is about the marriage. So the legal contract between the husband and the wife. Um, Separation agreements are not legally binding. Um, They they are usually used where a husband and wife have decided to separate, but they want to wait a little while before they embark on the, the divorce to have the marriage dissolved. Um, at the moment, although that's due to change, at the moment, um, unless you've been separated for a period of time, you can only petition for divorce based on either um, your ex's unreasonable behaviour or their adultery. Mm-hmm. Um, and so where you don't want to be throwing mud or where those things haven't happened, um, couples, separated couples then find themselves in a situation where they don't love each other anymore but they don't want to be, like I said, sort of throwing mud um, and they need to sort out the finances and and the children. And that's where a separation agreement comes in really handy because if it's done properly, um, and that is that um, it's it's signed and witnessed and the overall settlement is is fair, then it's likely that although it's not legally binding, once you come, once you go down the road of divorce, that agreement can then be ratified by the court. Um, there are certain caveats that might mean that that agreement will have to change, but it, it gives the parties that little bit more certainty um, in terms of their arrangements and it crystallizes what they've agreed. Um, so divorce and separation agreements are, are two entirely separate things. If a couple have decided that they they are ready to dissolve the marriage by by divorce, then we would typically advise them to to get what's called a financial order rather than a separation agreement, Um, mainly because there are certain orders um, that can't be covered in a separation agreement and I won't go into too much detail but things like a pension sharing order you you can't that can't be implemented in a separation agreement so if a husband and wife agree that say for example the wife is going to get a share of the husband's pension 
that that can't be um, actually implemented unless the court ratifies the document so that there's an order in place. Um, so I would say if couples are divorcing, then get a financial order. Um, the other reason is that at some point, even if you get a separation agreement, uh, you will want that agreement endorsed into an order at some point. So rather than paying twice, you're better off just getting that, that original document into an order as you go through the divorce. And it's funny because just you talking about that, I just want to kind of put you on the spot a little bit and dispel a myth or not. I've had clients previously coming to me and saying, her, them and their ex have done what they call a kitchen table separation agreement where they've written it themselves and they've signed it. I mean, is that legal? Um, no, in a nutshell, it's, it's not a legally binding document, particularly if um, one or both parties have not had legal advice. Mm -hmm. It's important that a separation agreement um, covers the, the financial settlement in a way that represents a fair outcome. So if you have a husband and wife sat, on the, uh, sat at the kitchen table, as you say, and the husband feels guilty for whatever he's done or, or, or the wife feels guilty and then they say why well, I'm I'm not going to touch anything and I'm going to give it all to you that in itself wouldn't be fair and so that doesn't really carry any weight at all mm -hmm. um, a separation agreement should really reflect the same terms as a financial order because what you want ultimately is for the court to endorse it at a later stage what I would also say is a separation agreement should also have a schedule of the party's finances attached to it so that at a later stage that the court who who you're asking to endorse the order can then see right well these are the the, the finances of the parties their assets and income and so I think that this agreement that they reached um, it is fair. Mm. Thank you. Touching on one point there, then, when you were saying around, obviously, the, the reasons for divorce, I mean, obviously, we all know, but for some others, they might not, that obviously, uh, is it next August now that no fault divorce uh, comes into place, um, which I think would save uh, a lot of the mudslinging and the blame game between people. Um, but whilst it's not there at the moment, and even thereafter, the reasons for a divorce proceeding what actual legal impact do they have? Does it matter what those reasons are? Or is it more to just, let, let's say with infidelity, for example, um, is it more so that the petitioning party, let's say hypothetically, the wife is petitioning because husband's had an affair, mm. is it just because they want that reason there? Does it actually make any legal impact what the reasons are or is it irrelevant? So if it's adultery, the, the petitioning, the respondent, so the person that you're saying has committed adultery, has to agree to it and ideally confess to it in what's called a confession statement. Yeah. So, I mean, unless one or both parties are willing to lie, really, the, the person will have had to have committed adultery. And so it, it does matter. You know, you, this is a legal document that you're presenting to the court and effectively you're asking the court to sever a legal contract uh, being the marriage. Um, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily affect the finances so you know we have clients come in that say that say well he's had an affair and therefore he shouldn't get the house unfortunately in in this country the two are unrelated um, but in terms of the divorce um, and that is just the marriage itself uh, yes in, it, it does matter what you are petitioning um, on um, with unreasonable behaviour, you have to meet a certain threshold because, okay. again, you, you are severing a contract. So you, are, you, are, you have to justify to the court why that contract has to be severed. Um, unreasonable behaviour is a funny one because it's not, let's say you, you're going through a divorce, Tom. It's not uh, as a third party for me to say whether those unreasonable behaviour examples are um, unreasonable they're subjective to you yes um, but they must also meet a threshold and um, a few years ago there was actually quite a famous case which all family solicitors will know called Owens and Owens where Mrs. Mrs. Owens petitioned for divorce um, on unreasonable behavior and the husband defended and he said that his behavior wasn't unreasonable 
And ultimately, although Mrs. Owens um, appealed, she's now had to wait until, actually, I think it's 2020, so she might have already done it. Um, she's had to wait five years to petition on five years separation because mm. her unreasonable behavior examples didn't meet that threshold. So, um, you know, it, it is important. You are going through a legal process and there are certain um, hoops that you have to jump through. Yeah. You said about it doesn't impact things like the finances. Would it impact child matters? Um, you can, you can. So, for example, with unreasonable behaviour, you can you can reiterate those um, examples in separate children proceedings. Mm -hmm. But you citing, uh, for example, how your husband behaved towards the children in the divorce petition itself doesn't impact on on child arrangements. You're next, Bay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm getting through these really nicely. Thank you for your I'm, I'm starting to feel like boys should be asking us questions because we've just been going. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Um, but actually, it, it's brilliant. You know, anyone watching this, it could be answering the questions that they have. Yeah. And, you know, boys making it clear that it's okay to just go and get that advice to get the ball rolling. It doesn't mean you're signing into anything. If you're armed with everything that you need, it's just going to make everything so much easier. Um, I mean, the next question I've got for you is about mediation, because I know a lot of people have mediation. And I just wanted to ask you if you were telling someone who didn't know, what is it? When would people need it? And what do people go to mediation for? So mediation, uh, firstly, I'll say I, I'm a big fan of mediation. Um, I think with the right mediator and uh, both parties being, you know, in the right headspace, it, it can really um, narrow down the issues, if not completely resolve all the issues. So mediation is where separated couples uh, will sit in a room um, with a qualified mediator. Um, the, the mediators that um, I refer clients to, they are normally solicitors as well, who are also qualified as mediators. So they'll know the legal process. Now they can't advise specifically a husband or a wife, um, but what they can do is sort of say, this, this is what the court can do, this is what the court can't do. And try to get them to discuss between themselves with their guidance on, uh, on an outcome, whether that's child arrangements, whether that's um, financial arrangements, it's just about getting them both in a room. Um, and the reason why I'm a big believer in mediation is uh, for, for two reasons. Cost, if you can sort all of your issues out in mediation, you are going to be saving masses because the alternative, if you don't try that form of dispute resolution or something similar, you are looking at both parties being legally represented, having letters going back and forth, um, phone calls, emails, that kind of thing, and ultimately going to court. Um, and then so the second reason is that it avoids delay considerably. Um, you know, at the moment, particularly because of the pandemic, we are seeing massive court delays, huge. Um, we're unable to explain to clients sort of we don't even know the timescales anymore. Um, so it's difficult to, to manage that side of things. Um, but when you can have two people sat together in a room, that has got to be better than, you know, letters going back and forth. I may never meet a client's ex-partner unless it's in court. So, and that sort of engagement that you have in a room, whether it's virtual like this or, or, physically at a table, it, it, it's invaluable. So um, I would say mediation is something that every client, unless there's good reason like physical violence um, or, or any form of domestic violence that would mean that they can't do it, uh, it, it's really something that you should try. And actually the courts require you to have tried mediation unless you're exempt um, before you apply to court now. Thank you. I've got some questions around child matters then, because yes. everyone knows that I'm a, uh, uh, a busy dad. Um, one of my questions around legal rights for fathers, married or unmarried, 
um, particularly in those earlier days for access and then actual overall parental responsibility or joint parental responsibility, I should say, particularly in those, those early days. I know, and again, this is just me from my own kind of research and stuff, I believe in Greece, it was, was it this year or last year, that Greece um, brought in an equal uh, a shared parental responsibility for separating and divorcing parents. Uh, and I believe the Netherlands have as well now. So how does it work here in the UK, for, especially in those early days, like you say? So parental responsibility um, is, it, mothers automatically have it. It's all the rights and duties over a child that you would have as a parent. Mm -hmm. Fathers, if you are named as a father on the birth certificate of that child, you will have parental responsibility or if you're married to the mother um, and or either at the time of birth or after. Um, so that parental responsibility is equal. The mother has no higher rights than the father, whether it's on the day of separation or 10 years after separation. Um, what the, so, so from a legal point of view, there is no difference. Um, but from a practical point of view, if, um, say, for example, the father leaves the house and then the mother has the children um, and then he goes to see, he, he picks up the children, let's say, every other weekend. Yeah. Although he shares legal rights uh, exactly the same way as the mother, what he's done is he has created a precedent. He's created um, sort of this arrangement. So it's important that he gets legal advice so he knows the implications of that because the longer he goes on seeing uh, his children every other weekend the harder it is for him to succeed in say for an application where he wants to have the children half the time doesn't mean it's impossible at all it just means that you know it's one more thing for the courts to consider is that quite difficult though in the early days let's say hypothetically speaking and i'll use my own experience as you usually tend to do that I had left to go out for a pint of milk, but was then told not going back in the house. So that precedent wasn't set by me, it was set by the other party and family surrounding. Mm -hmm. And we automatically went into the situation of every other weekend, mm -hmm. at my ex-wife's decision, not mine. Mm -hmm. So how do I, how would someone say, well, actually I want my kids? Yeah, well, it's, yeah it's funny you say that. So. Um... In 2014, there was a new act, so it's called the Children and Families Act, and it dealt with both what's called public and private law children, um, and it, did, it made a lot of changes, but one of the significant changes that it made was that the court had to presume that uh, both parents' involvement in the child would improve the welfare of the child. So there's already that presumption there that both parties had to have an active involvement in the children's in a child's life um, and we've seen a, a shift in sort of a, a father's desire to be involved in 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 their child's life that you know it's it's no longer the case that they're working monday to friday full time there, there's flexible working arrangements now which means that they can get involved with um you know school pickups and drop-offs um homework after school clubs all those things and we see that that's what I say dads and that's uh, generic but that's what the non-resident parent wants they want to be more involved in the day-to-day -day, um, sort of involvement of a child and what that new act does it's not new anymore but what that act does is it it makes that presumption so unless there's a reason not to then the courts should encourage it so when you make an application to court, you're no longer on the back foot trying to fight against this sort of alternate weekend precedent you've set as, as much because this act is now saying, well, you know, if, if, if the non-resident parent does want more time with their child, why should it not happen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Rather than why should it happen? Why should it not? Yeah. Yeah. You've actually already answered my other question, which was going to be, do the courts favour mum or dad or equal? But you kind of already answered that, so I'll put a line through that and let Faye ask that. <laughs> you know, the thing that's come to my mind, Paul, and it's not in my questions, as you've been talking about parental responsibility, does that change if there's been such as domestic abuse or something like that? No. It's the same. 
So there are certain orders that the court can make that can um, curb that parental responsibility. Um, so for example, if um, a parent has uh, tried to remove a child out of the country, for example, then, you know, there are orders that the court can make to, to stop that from happening. Um, or if a uh, vaccinations, for example, if, if, if a parent wanted a certain vaccination um, and the other parent doesn't, there are certain orders that the court can make to either allow that or forbid that from happening. But um, in the first instance, th that parent responsibility is equal. Okay. That's interesting. You've now my mate, my mind's now going about. Oh, I haven't had a, <laughs> I haven't had a conversation with my ex-wife about vaccines. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think you know, for me and you, Tom, we're both very lucky. L like you, I have uh, my exes are, are very much co-parents in both my children's lives, as as you are and, and your ex. It just makes life a lot easier. Getting to that stage, as we've discussed in previous podcasts, isn't always easy. No. It is a, a working process and you know that's a good thing that solicitors it's their role to, to to kind of smooth the path in front of in front of the people that are going through this process and separations and, and divorces and things like that see it's really interesting because i didn't actually know about the act that you were talking about Poi, from 2014 wasn't it did you say i didn't know about that until after i'd gone through the courts process for child arrangement orders um it's something that i actually didn't know about until after um, in actual fact, I didn't know about it until... That would have made a difference? Um, potentially. Um, who knows? Hypothetically, it could, have, it could have made things easier. It could have made things more contentious in some respects, potentially. Um, so I suppose it's, it is hands a piece of string. We won't know now. Um, but I mean, the best part about it is that I did go through that process. I did fight for what I thought was right um and for the benefit of, uh, of of my children so that they did have an an equal input and it's really interesting what you say about how saying fathers but you're right um at the moment probably unfortunately um that the secondary caregiver um usually particularly would be the man i think things are changing and like you say that also that that is also societal changes as well because we're not going down the coal pit from eight till six and mums at home doing everything um and i think people are more are more involved and actually those roles have been been diversifying anyway which i think is absolutely a brilliant thing anyway um and i think i've probably said this in every podcast so far Faye, and i say it in almost every client session i'm a much better part-time parent um than i was a full-time parent because actually i get that moment where i miss my children when they're not here and they're at mums and i really look forward to them being here and then when they are i'm really present and i'm really engaged and really involved then when they're not i have a, i can have a bottle of wine with my other half but <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, I can do zooms and stuff like that um, <laughs> it's interesting tom isn't it because um i wanted to ask poi as my son has grown up he did used to i was more the resident parent i mean he's 10 now and he's old enough now to kind of make his own decisions and he does go and see dad more we are more on an equal footing and I've let my son decide that you know is there a legal age where courts will say well this child is old enough to decide where to live or how yeah. much time to spend with each yeah. parent we do get asked that question quite a lot some parents think that it's three or four other parents you know think that it's 10 12 um there's there's no set age Okay. Um, but I would say th the voice of a child starts being heard from about eight. Um, it won't be the determining factor. As they get older, that voice gets stronger. Yeah. Um, so I would say 12 onwards, unless there's a reason why, as in a welfare safety concern, um, what the, the, the desires um, and wishes and feelings of uh, a teenager uh, will probably be the loudest. Yeah, and it's really important to listen to those child voices, isn't it? And, yeah. and to, to find out what they want, because mm -hmm. we've talked about many times before, Tom, you know, ch children in the middle of divorces, it, it's scary for them, it's confusing, and you have to be as open and honest as you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they need to feel that they are being listened to and their wishes are being taken account of as well. Yeah, it's, it's a fine line um, 
because yes, children's voices should be heard, but equally your role as a parent is to guide them and give them that safety um, and sort of discipline, as it were, to say, you might not want to see your dad, but you will. And I will make that decision because I am your mummy or, you know, whatever it is. And I'm just echoing what I suppose I would say to my son if that were to happen. Um, But it's important to not rely fully on on the voice of a child, but to to give it its due where it's, you know, where it's. I suppose it's also it's a bit of a judgment call isn't it, in terms of is that really their voice like you're saying or is it the voice of the other party that's feeding through them yeah. um, when maybe they do have more time with them or saying well actually your mum's done this or your dad's done that and trying to coerce them uh, and change their thought process in fact my my partner Donna did that, the same thing with with uh, with her daughter with my stepdaughter with Leone um when her and her dad weren't kind of seeing eye to eye and would make sure that she went to see her dad that she kept going and kept yeah. the relationship going and help them through that and being supportive by making her go um and in fact she was here this morning and before i jumped on the podcast she was getting ready to go out i was like where are you going she's going to her dad's um had they have not done that i unfortunately i think we all witness it don't we there are other situations where there are particular teenagers and usually uh, or even potentially younger children where they're saying one thing but actually it's not necessarily what they really think or feel it's now something that's been projected onto them that they've been taught they're supposed to think and feel yeah. but actually it's not them so that must be really difficult from a legal perspective I know it is from a coaching perspective yeah because there's so many different ways that can happen so where a child is echoing the voice of a parent sometimes you can tell just by the language that they're using so it wouldn't be quite age appropriate uh, because they're saying words that are probably a little bit too advanced for their age yeah um but then you have ones where the the thoughts of a parent particularly in the negative thoughts become their thoughts mm-hmm. so so although they've been influenced and initially you know they would have just been told certain things they then begin to believe it And it's those cases that are really hard because yes, it is the wishes and feelings of the child, but they're only there because of having heard and been surrounded by this sort of atmosphere uh, that's been created by this, by the parent that doesn't want the other parent involved. Yeah. Yeah. So that's always a difficult one. And it's worth talking as well. I know my son went through through this a few years ago where he didn't want to say anything. He didn't want to upset me. He didn't want to go and upset his dad. So he was left with, it's better for me not to say anything. And he held everything in. And that's not good for the child either. No, no. And just going back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, uh, who should you speak to when you've decided that you want to embark on a separation? It's important to speak to the children's school as well, Um, not just from um, sort of a safety perspective, if, if, you don't want certain people, let's say, for example, we have um, situations where grandparents of your ex might be picking up the child and that you that might not happen anymore. Yeah. But they'll still want to turn up. But there's also the support aspect for a child. Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, the educational welfare officers that probably need to know that, that there is some there's going to be some disruption at home so that that child can get the support that the school otherwise wouldn't have known about. Yeah, yeah. We'll do um, interesting actually because I was thinking this morning we should there is actually a session we should be doing at some point today which is about again in the early days of first the first discussions with your children mm. and the steps from there. So I think there could be a whole host of other questions and another complete different avenue to go. Down. <laughs> uh, yeah. Certainly no. is. Have you got any more questions, Tom? Uh, I haven't. You've answered absolutely loads. I'm also conscious of the size of this file that I'm going to compare, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Sorry. also poise time uh, uh, as I well. Let me just end with one then that I haven't asked. And I know Tom, you've skirted around it. Um, you know, why generally is it that more people will apply for divorces in, in the first week back? You know, after Christmas and New Year, it happens, doesn't it, every year that solicitors get really, really inundated with people wanting appointments, wanting information. When we hear the the Black Friday for relationships. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't know whether it's the same for 
all family sisters, but I, certainly a, a large portion of us, when we hear the word divorce day, it's like an inward groan. Yes. Um, it, it, it is a bit of a myth. Uh, unfortunately, you, you do see perhaps a spike in inquiries. Yeah. Um, and that is typically because over Christmas, you know, you've got the stress of Christmas itself, uh, financial pressures in terms of, you know, having to buy certain things, um, meeting family members and all the shops being shut. So your, so your, your sole focus then is your family. Um, and then things may or may not happen, arguments may or may not happen that then lead you to, to speak to a solicitor. So we do see a spike in inquiries, but actually before um, I came onto this podcast, I looked at the, the family court statistics. So I wanted to see just out of interest really what the statistics were for, for this year and whether or not the, the spike in inquiries that we experienced then led on to divorce petitions. And interestingly, so, um, this year, January to March, there were 29,540 divorce petitions uh, being lodged. But then April to June, 56,867. So it's not true. It's not true that there is um, a spike in divorces. Uh, there may be a spike in, in inquiries. But I would say that actually for us, things start to get busier from March, maybe end of February. And that might be a financial thing. You know, it might be a case that people want to get divorced after Christmas, but they're waiting for the next payday, um, yeah. you know, before they, they go ahead with anything. Yeah, get that first payday and then you've got Valentine's Day and then you're like, well, I might as well wait till Easter. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's it. That's really interesting because you're now making me wonder about, is that relatable to the first lockdown? because that's a huge jump. Well, actually, again, from the statistics, despite the lockdown, it actually went down by 18% for the same period. So mm -hmm. in 2019, between April and June, it was 18% less. So it's not gone up. But again, during lockdown, it was like a switch. We just started to get inquiries after inquiries. Mm -hmm. um, but lots of people, it's because it's a knee-jerk reaction. They've never spent this much time yeah. with their spouses. They can't go to work. They can't go to the gym. They can't socialize. They can't even go to the shops or, or do anything just to let off some steam. And so, you know, you're, you are going to be, you're, you're cooped up, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you, you make inquiries, but that doesn't, things then calm down. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll end up in divorce, which is why going back to what we were saying before, speak to a solicitor. You don't know what you don't know. Yes. So get all your options. And I suppose from there as well, if you've got people that aren't kind of inquiring, if you've had that kind of knee jerk reaction of he's pissed me off, she's done this mm -hmm. and you make that inquiry and then actually you kind of calm it down a bit and think about it and kind of work through it and actually then maybe the next step or thought process is okay well what other support resources are there and like you said earlier are there coaches uh, or if coaching isn't right for you counseling or therapy something else that maybe can help you guys work on your communication or whatever it might be um to maybe assist you uh, if, if that's not the right path for you uh, and yeah and that's it as as family solicitors we do have to make sure and there's a requirement for us to speak to you about um, reconciling and trying marriage guidance, counselling, all those kind of things. Because once you embark on the journey of divorce, it's it tends to snowball. Yeah. So it's hard to then go back. You've got the costs and legalities of, of withdrawing your petition if you change your mind. So it's always best that you take your time to make sure that the marriage is truly over. Do whatever it takes. And then once you feel I have done everything I can, there is no way back, then go down divorce or you know, whatever option you want to take to end the marriage. There's also a mindset part to that as well, um, whereby the kind of when people get into that winning, I have to win mentality, like you say, you've already started going down the rabbit hole. You can't yeah. go back now and I have to keep going and I have to prove that I was right and I have to win and I have to, uh, and then people get stuck into that blame game and things like that and the mudslinging. So um, no, 
really interesting. Thank you for, 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 for coming on, Dave. You got any questions for us as coaches? <laughs> So we've had some involvement, obviously, you and I, Tom, with um, some clients. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I think um, led me to want to meet you was because some clients that we have really struggle with making decisions uh, because, as we talked about earlier, they're not in the right headspace. Mm -hmm. Do you, when, when a client comes in to, to, to see you, mm -hmm. do you, do you see the difficulties that they're facing and can you are there me mechanisms by which you use to help them go through that process so is it a case that you would prefer to see them before they see me or is it preferable to you to see them while they're seeing me because I certainly find it helpful for you know for you to be involved throughout the process but is it easier for you to just see them at the beginning you know throughout yeah, it's really hounds a picture. It can really depend because it's all it's also circumstantial. It's what the situation is and what's going on. So for some people, I've had clients. I don't know if you've had this way, but I've had uh, some clients who have come to me, had their free discovery call, um, and by the end of it, they've actually kind of gone off with a change of perspective or a change of situation or a change of view or whatever it might be or something that's kind of a, a little switch has gone and it's made them think differently or maybe even approach something differently. Um, for other people all too often they're usually quite stuck in that situation so there's a whole host of mechanisms and techniques and it's not I always remember when I was being trained I was always being <laughs> always being uh, everything I was being taught I was always told by my trainers that it's not like there's any one thing that you can do for an individual because we all respond and I suppose resonate to things in different ways and sometimes it might be the first 20 minutes or the first 15 sessions for the individual that might be loosening the grip on the situation and then the one thing you kind of get to all of a sudden that might be the light bulb for, moment for them that, that, that resonates with them and that, that that can be just so many different things from reframing their perspective uh, really setting a, a personal goal for them and how they're going to get there because they're like you say constantly with the trees it might be things about procrastination it might be about their self-confidence and self-esteem it's so many different things so in answer to your question it would be great to see people beforehand and I would hope that one day in the future um what Bay and I do would be seen as a kind of an initial go-to let's go and get a free consultation with a coach for half an hour whatever it is mm. maybe find out a little bit about where I'm at what I'm dealing with what I could do if the if the relationship really is over right let's go and talk to a solicitor and then we can refer on to yourself, et cetera. Um, I think that'd be great one day. I think at the moment it is more so that people come to us when they're quite in the thick of it. Yeah. Um, and that then can be a bit more difficult, um, of course, because they're yeah. already in the blame game. They're already, the emotions are really high. The tensions are running high. They're worried about money. They're worried about where the kids are going to be or losing the kids or not seeing the kids. And you're working with so much so quickly and it's all really really high tension that you're trying to cover a lot of different things and trying to turn that temperature dial down mm -hmm. so preferably it would be great if people came at the very earlier stages so that they didn't ramp up into this kind of heightened emotional state yeah. um, because you could work with things a bit earlier and a bit easier yeah it's it's funny um when you were saying earlier about winning and losing um if the client's not getting the right support they've become sort of entrenched in that in, in sort of that mindset yeah. uh, and one of the really interesting things um from our discussion tom when when we met um you gave me an example about rolling up a newspaper yeah and using a chair um and i don't know if you've heard this bay but it, um, you can probably explain it better than I can, Tom, but it was, <laughs> how hard can you hit that chair? Um, okay. And now imagine that chair is your child. And it, it does, it, it changes the way you think because clients become so entrenched in, they were so horrible to me. It was so awful. This is what I want it, uh, as retribution. Um, and, you know, this is not all clients, but the, the, the really bad cases that they, they do start thinking that way. And, I think one of the really helpful um, services that they, they can um, use is, is like um, you both, where you change your mindset 
Um, and it does take something as drastic as rolling up a newspaper and, 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 and hitting a chair for, because it has to be a physical thing to almost jolt them out yeah. of, of the, the, the way of thinking. With that person, I actually put a picture of their kid on the chair so they could actually envisage their child being in the chair. And every time to say something to the chair, yeah. <laughs> Um, but it's true because I've said this, I don't even know how many times, I always say, explain about the winning and losing aspects of a, a separation divorce, specifically where children are involved, and I gave Fane so I've been saying this a million times, um, there is only one winner or loser, there isn't both, there isn't dad wins and mum loses or vice versa, there is one winner or loser, and that's your children, mm. and you as the adults get to decide if they win, or if they lose, and it's down to your actions and your approach and the things you say and the things you don't say as mm. well and how you respond and react to situations and your choices of what you do and how you approach it. And that's not to say that one's right or wrong with the parent, uh, with, with, with either of the parents. It's about both of them, but they both have to bring their own actions and responsibilities to the table to improve the situation for the child. Um, and again, that's one of the things really early on. It's around, well, it's not about the blame game. It's not about what they did to you. You say you want some control and some power back. Well, what can you do? What can you bring to the table? Yeah. How could you approach it differently? What could you do, you personally, not them, what could you do that impacts the situation positively? Mm. What could you change? Nothing's yeah. going to change. You're saying the other party's not going to make any changes and they're doing this and they're doing that. Okay, so what can you do? Yeah. It's really hard, Tom, you know, when you're in the thick of it to, to be able to take that step back and have that clarity. I know for me, if I had, had um, counselling or therapy or coaching before I walked into that solicitor's office for my first session and I'd been allowed to just offload, let it all out, I think I would have dealt with it a lot better. Mm. Yeah. Someone sitting there listening, saying, yes, I understand. Mm. I can be in empathy with you. I know what you're going through. And it just would have made taken the edge off it for me without me going into that solicitor's office and sitting there literally welling up not being able to think mm. um not being able to say what I needed to say and, and pushing it down until I got outside and then I I cried all the way down the high street because it was so emotional yeah and, and a big step you know I've had clients who've literally come to me after they've had the absolute drop on their mat and that's been their you know, their moment, their rabbit in the headlights and thinking, what the hell am I going to do now? So mm. I think any step you come to see a coach or a counsellor is good. Yeah. That's, that's, a really, good. that's a really important point, Faye, about what you said about where you're kind of pushing that thought down and that feeling down and not saying the things that you want to say or should say or would like to say. So, I, and I always do that very early on in the very first session after, or even sometimes towards the, the latter part of a discovery call, once they've got that narrative out, once they've told that story, it's then, okay, great. Like, I'm here with you, I empathise with you, I know what you're going through, I've seen this a million times before. You've told me all of the story and you've got that narrative out. What's the bit you're not saying? Yeah. yeah What's yeah. the bit that you don't want to tell anyone? Mm. Or inside the story of the narrative, because I know, because if we all do this, we all tell ourselves a story, and again, I tell it like it is. <laughs> <laughs> what, what part of that narrative was was crap what part of that was bullshit what what you lying to me about or what you're not saying that mm. we because that's where the gold is and that's how we figure it out and help you move forward yeah and you know i find it really helpful having you involved tom just purely from uh, for, for my own benefit in terms of getting clear instructions but we find a lot of clients they they, they don't understand that we're not emotionally you know we're not trained in that area and they they then want to use us as counsellors, which is not cost effective and it's not tapping into the right service. Um, you know, when we met before, you were telling me about all the different ways in which a, a person could absorb information. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they're things that I, uh, I wouldn't even know where to start. And I think it's really good that a client can access both your services and mine together mm -hmm. because it's about just coming to the best outcome yeah. for them as a family and to be able to get clear instructions on the legal process and then being able to manage their emotions while they go through the process and then afterwards yeah. so you know if you were to see a client and they i think one of the things was was audible sort of 
they're better at listening to things or seeing things um, and you told me about a client that you go and walks with because he's more comfortable doing it that way I, I wouldn't even know how to tell um, you know if a client was better at that mode of of listening than, than another mode so I think what clients need is that more holistic service because ultimately it's them that benefit from it yeah no completely agree so, is there any more questions for us from you, boy? No, I think uh, I think we've talked enough. I don't even know how long we've been talking for. I, I can't see the screen. <laughs> you might have to edit it a little bit. <laughs> you know, we could say we've only just literally skimmed the surface. You know, we could go on forever. There's so many questions that listeners were thinking. Well, they didn't answer that, and they didn't answer this, and that's okay. We did as much as we could, and I hope it's going to be of value to to people that are going to listen. Absolutely. And if any of the audience are watching this, whether it's when we post it uh, in January or some point next year or whenever, um, if you would like to raise a question on anything that we've spoken about, another topic, or indeed you, you would like mine, Bayes, or, or of course even uh, Poi's contact details, do get in touch and contact us. Poi, I imagine you're happy for us to point people in your direction if they're asking for it? Uh, yeah, so we offer, <laughs> yeah, we offer free initial advice. Um, so... You know, anyone that has some questions by all means give us a call uh, but you know I should also say that Tom and I have have a, a scheme in place don't we where if if they feel that they need sort of that emotional side as well then then Hunter and Euro will meet the cost of that so that they're getting the right support and guidance as they go through their journey. Yeah fantastic what we'll also do is at the end of the video as always our contact information will pop up and our Instagrams LinkedIn's blah 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 um Boy, we'll add yours in as well of course so people can contact you directly uh and uh, yeah no thanks for coming on it's been a real pleasure it's lovely to see you for having me yes it's been my first ever before. podcast <laughs> you're, you're, a star. Really you're really amazing well. oh, <laughs> better than being tom did on our first one that's for sure <laughs> it's quite nerve-wracking isn't it <laughs> right well nice see you uh take care and uh yeah we'll catch up soon definitely thanks guys Bye.